I'm Andrew Dalton. I'm the director of the Adams County Historical Society here in Gettysburg. And it is a beautiful day. I must say we do a lot of programs and I don't know if I've ever seen better weather here in, in Gettysburg on the battlefield. Uh, but tonight we're, we're west of town and we're going to kind of take you on a tour of the first day's field and, and answer any questions you have. Uh, the program is called Ask a Historian and we do have our historian of the Adams County Historical Society, Tim Smith, with us tonight. Um, I'll introduce, I'll bring Tim on in a second. Um, but uh, throughout the program, please let us know if you have any questions about the first day's battlefield, about um, the monuments, the farms, the people who lived here, um, and any other topic you can imagine. We'll try to do our best to answer every question. We've got Alexander behind the, the camera. He's going to help us uh, field your questions. Um, we have some people watching, Alexander? Good. Yep. Wonderful. So thank you for joining us, and, and uh, we appreciate you uh, supporting the Adams County Historical Society. We've been around here in Gettysburg since the 1880s, and we preserve millions of historic items that are just in, in, incredible and tell the story of, uh, of Gettysburg. So, um, without any further ado, I'm going to take Tim's phone away from him before it starts going off and uh, try to help monitor questions. Tim Smith, our historian, is here. And uh, Tim, why don't you give people watching an idea of first where we are and, and what the first day's battlefield uh, looked like at the time of the Civil War? Well, you know, the field of battle for July 1st, 1863, is pretty much just open fields. We don't have a lot of features like Little Round Top or Devil's Den. There are not as many rocks on the first day's battlefield. And pretty much the entire area around Gettysburg was farmland. And this area is characterized by large farms. And so pretty much the first day's battle is a fight where one unit is standing in an open field and another unit is charging across an open field attacking that position. So um, uh, as we uh, talk about the first day, you know, a lot of it is just farms. And uh, there are some uh, woods and there are some streams. Um, you know, the, probably the uh, woodlot that's the most famous is the Herbst woodlot. We, I do, did bring some uh, uh, maps along, and I, I wanted to mention that uh, you, you probably know that the Adams County Historical Society published a book uh, years ago, and I was the author, Farms at Gettysburg. Basically, it's a book that highlights some of the farms on the battlefield through the photographs that are owned by the Adams County Historical Society. So it's basically just a book that has some farm photos in it. It wasn't meant to be like a uh, be-all, end-all book about all the farms or have information about every farm, just the ones that we had really interesting photographs of. Now, uh, uh, I think the major complaint I get when people uh, talk about the book or ask me questions about it is there's no map in the book showing you where the farms are located. Uh, uh, years earlier, before the Farms book came out, I actually helped on uh, the research for a map. Um, and this uh, is part of a series of maps that were created by the Friends of the National Park prior to the Gettysburg Foundation. And the map maker was a guy named Tom Disjordan. And um, uh, I was part of a team of people that helped him do a map of the first day's fighting, the second day's fighting, and the third day's fighting. But what I had suggested when we started the project is a map that showed all the farms around the battlefield. I thought that would be kind of an interesting uh, idea. And it got included as a fourth map in the map set. Uh, I'd imagine you can still find this on the internet, but I don't think that there's many copies left and I don't think it's sold at the park bookstore uh, anymore. But what I tried to do, and um, or what I set out to do, I should say, is put the name of every person that owned a farm on the battlefield on the map. And basically what I did is I took the maps that existed of the area where the fighting occurred, the Warren map of the battlefield has some of the farms listed by name. Uh, I used the 1858 Adams County wall map. I used the uh, 1872 atlas and then some other sources were available. I used uh, Cumberland Township tax records for the first day's battlefield. And what I did was I tried to figure out uh, who was the owner of each farm. And then I, I did keep a card on how many acres the farm was. Um, something similar to this 
1977, I believe it was, park historian Kathy George took the area that the park owned and tried to determine the boundaries of the properties of the farmers at, at that time. So um, that's very similar. And the park does have a copy of that, that map also. But um, what's interesting is this was the first time when people put the full names of the people that own their property. And of course you might know that people own farms, but they live in the town. And a lot of the farms on the battlefield have a tenant farmer. And if known, we put the name of the tenant farmer on the map. And believe it or not, some of the more famous farms on the second day's battlefield, we don't know who lived in the farm at the time because there are no records that tell us the name of a renter. But if there was a battle claim or damage claim uh, after the battle for some of these farms, usually they mention the name of the tenant farmer in the claim, so we have some of them. Now, we're standing uh, east of Willoughby's Run, and uh, there's not that many farms in this immediate area, especially the ones that are owned by the park. And uh, Andrew might talk about that in a moment. But uh, obviously, between Willoughby's Run, Seminary Ridge, uh, the Hagerstown Road, and the Mummersburg Road, we only have a few farms. We have the uh, Jacob J or John Herbst Farm. Sometimes I call him John Jacob Herbst. I think I get it confused with John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt. But uh, the, we got the Herbst Farm, and that includes the Herbst Woodlot, which is um, just off to our right. And this fence line that was here at the time of the battle at the edge of the woods is actually the boundary between the Herbst property and the McPherson property. And the McPherson property extended uh, from about Willoughby's Run to Seminary Ridge in the distance. You might see the Lutheran Seminary buildings out there. And it actually, uh, the farm went over the Chambersburg Turnpike across what we refer to as the unfinished railroad excavation to another fence line that was north of the railroad excavation out in that direction. And then, of course, beyond that, we had a farm owned by James J. Wills, and all these farms are, are shown on the various maps. James J. Wills was uh, the father of David Wills, who lived in the town. And, of course, Abraham Lincoln stayed at his house uh, four months after the battle. James J. Wills lived with David Wills, we believe, at the time of the Gettysburg Address. But a tenant farmer uh, resided at that farm, and his name was William Job or William Job. Where we're not sure exactly how he pronounced his name. Um, and then, of course, north, north of that, along um, uh, the Mummersburg Road, is uh, the farm of John Forney. So there are not many farms on the main part of the first day's battlefield from uh, the Hagerstown Road to the Mummersburg Road. I think Andrew wants to talk a little bit about a, another farm that was near here also, just across the creek. Right, well, first, uh, let me uh, answer one question. So someone asked where the site of the McPherson house was. Um, and it's actually right behind us. So the, the house no longer stands. I believe it burned in 1890, is that 1895. right? 1895. 1895, in, in a fire here on the property. The barn does still stand. Uh, we actually just put a video up uh, from the barn on, on our YouTube page, so you can check that out. But uh, we did, when we counted earlier of the, the farms on the battlefield, I think we came up with 11 farms that the Park Service owns on the first day's battlefield. And how you qualify that, you know, it, it's kind of difficult because some farms don't stand anymore, but the, the park owns the field that it was located in, or maybe the park owns a portion of the farm. But on this side of the road, you know, as Tim mentioned, the McPherson farm, the Herbst farm, and then across Willoughby's run was the, the Emanuel Harmon farm. Um, so these three farms saw heavy fighting on the first day of the battle, um, and all of them had uh, families living here at the time. The Slentz family, the Harmons lived in the house across the Willoughby's Run, and then the Herbsts were actually also taking shelter in their home at the time. Um, so please let us know if you have any other questions. We'll, we'll try to answer as many as we can, but we are standing here on, on McPherson's Ridge. 
um, on a very beautiful evening. Uh, there's cows in the pasture, and we're also going to get in the car and drive around and visit some other sites. But behind me, I, I want to point out a couple monuments that you can see. So obviously, this is the the, equest the I wouldn't say equestrian, but the uh, the bronze uh, bust statue of uh, of John L. Burns, the hero of Gettysburg, who joined the fighting on on July 1st out here alongside the the Bucktail Brigade, and then ended up in the woods fighting alongside the Iron Brigade. Tim actually wrote the book on John Burns, as I'm sure many of you know. Tim, do you want to tell us a little bit more? I see we have a couple of people asking about this when the statue was dedicated and, and uh, anything else about this, this general area. Sure. Um, well, I'll mention that uh, if you come out of here to uh, uh, view the McPherson barn, um, uh, which has, was restored and we took, it was actually, the wall was taken apart and rebuilt by the War Department uh, in the early 1900s. It's just off behind those trees. But if you come out of here, there are four or five small trees out through that opening that marked the site of uh, the McPherson house. And I should mention that the house that burned in 1895 was a large uh, rebuilt McPherson house and it um, uh, probably included some of the original structure, but it was vastly uh, um, improved and enlarged uh, prior to its burning. So it wasn't a exact uh, Civil War house that burned down in that fire. But uh, John Burns, uh, the statue uh, to John Burns was placed here in 1902. Um, off the top of my head, and you know, I wrote a book on John Burns, I'm sure it's in there. I think it might have been like uh, February 1902, but it was dedicated on July 1st, uh, 1903. So the monument was here for a year before it was uh, dedicated. And it was sculpted by the Bureau Brothers of Philadelphia. And uh, the statue is sculpted to remind you of another famous American monument, and that is the Minuteman at Concord by Daniel Chester French. And I guess the Minuteman being a civilian warrior. You know, so it's a, it, it's, I, I think that's fascinating. They did it in that uh, same style. And it's always been one of my favorite monuments on the battlefield. Here's an interesting uh, tidbit that when I tell this to people, I don't know why it's one of the things that people really, really like to come out here and look for. But uh, the original course of what we refer to as Stone Avenue actually came in for the Chambersburg Pike across through where the monument is now. It ran along this fence line to the Herbst Woods where the road made a 90 degree turn and went across the front of Herbst Woods and then went to the 7th Wisconsin Monument where it made another 90 degree turn and went into what is Meredith Avenue uh, around the Herbst Woodlot. In uh, the late 1930s, early 1940s, I don't remember the exact date at the mo off the top of my head here, but they rerouted the road because of vehicular traffic not being able to handle the 90 degree turns. And they put in this slight bend of the road and they actually moved the road over there. And when they did that, they moved John Burns statue to this location and they actually moved the monument to the 14th Brooklyn, and uh, a monument up there to the 95th New York. And if you know where to look, you can actually find the bases of these monuments at their original positions on the other side of the original road. And John Burns' original position is on the other side of this fence out in that field. And the 14th Brooklyn has a little, um, a piece of granite out there and you can find that. So these would qualify as some of the moved monuments around the battlefield over the years. Couple questions. One, the McPherson farm, how damaged was it after the battle or by the battle? Uh, of course, you know, um, we don't have, uh, we have a damaged claim, but we don't have a lot of, uh, uh, I think if they go back and watch our video that we posted around the anniversary of the battle, I don't know when that one came out, maybe on, on July 1st it came out, if right. you look at it, we did a four or five minute video and I read a letter 
by the Slentz family, John Slentz, to Edward McPherson explaining some of the damages to the bar, the bar, the barn and the house, how many artillery shells that hit it, how damaged the property was and the rails and such. Okay. Yeah, uh, another question, uh, a lot of the farms around here were they used as hospitals, uh, uh, You know, <laughs> all the farms on the battlefield, let me put it this way, because I, I was around when Greg Coco was writing his book, uh, A Vast Sea of Misery, and he did that in the early 80s. And it was interesting, how do you qualify what a hospital is and what a hospital isn't? And when I talked to him about it, he said that if he found one account of one wounded soldier at a structure, then it was a hospital. But that's how he qualified it. You know, you have to qualify it somehow. Well, let me just suggest that every single structure was a hospital, every one of them. And it's just a matter of what kind of accounts can you find that, uh, you know, uh, give information about that structure. And yes, certainly the barn and the house were filled with wounded from the first day's battlefield here. Great. Yeah, okay, well, we're going to move, I think, to the car, and we're going to actually drive around some of the first day's battlefield and answer more of your questions. Um, we have one question. Maybe, Tim, you can answer it as we're walking. Uh, were there actually civilians that went out the Chambersburg Road and did delaying activities such as felling trees before the battle? Well, th these wouldn't be before the battle. The felling of trees was done by the local townspeople at the request of Major Granville O. Howler. And that was done on June 21st and June 23rd and June 24th prior to Juba early coming over the mountains and entering this area uh, of Pennsylvania, or you know, this uh, area around the town of Gettysburg, but not prior to the fighting on July 1st or anything like that. Let's get in the car. Okay, and again, we are just west of Gettysburg on McPherson's Ridge. We're going to keep taking you through the first day's battlefield and answering any questions that you have. We'll try not to uh, get into a car accident here while we answer your questions. <laughs> now, should we mention we've never done this before, so, you know, driving with the uh, uh, internet on, so hopefully we won't lose our signal. If we do lose our signal, just stay with us and the signal will return in a few minutes. That's our plan. That's correct. Yes. As we go around the battlefield, there are well over a thousand monuments and markers and tablets. Now, they're not on the first day's battlefield, on the Gettysburg National Military Park. Most of the monuments are 100 years old. Most of them were placed in the 1880s and 90s by the veterans of the battle themselves to mark the location of where units were positioned during the battle. We got a question. Were the woods as thick as they are today at, during the time of the battle? No. Now, <laughs> all evidence suggests that the woodlots at the time of the Civil War around the town did not have as much underbrush in them as they do today. The farmers um, grazed cattle in their woods. They needed their fields for crops. So the cows grazed in the woods. Also, if a tree fell down, the tree was immediately cut up and used for lumber, uh, for rails or firewood or for building purposes. And so the woods would be a lot more open. And besides that, there were a different type of tree that was used at that time. Uh, I should say that was prominent at that time. There's no longer a prominent tree and that's the chestnut. Right. And here, of course, we have one of the most famous regiments to fight at the Battle of Gettysburg. This is the monument to the 24th Michigan of the Iron Brigade. They suffered extremely heavy casualties here on the on the east side of Willoughby's Run at this high point. Of course, we're right in the middle of Herbst Woods now, and at the time of the battle, this road, Meredith Avenue, did not run through the woods. And so you can see there's been a lot of change to the, to the terrain. You can see the road really cut into the slope here. Um, but to our right, there's Willoughby's Run, and then through this woods, uh, General Reynolds, of course, is killed at, at around 10.30 on the morning of July 1st at the other side of the woods. Uh, so we'll keep going. There's heavy fighting here in the morning. General James J. Archer is captured during that first fight in Herbst Woods. He's captured just west of the creek to the, to the right of where we're driving. But um, in the afternoon, there's a second Confederate attack on this position, and eventually the Iron Brigade, after fighting for uh, very... <laughs> stubbornly for, for a very long time. They fall back gradually through the woods, back to Seminary Ridge, uh, to the Union fallback position. So the Iron Brigade monuments are here. You also see the bronze, uh, the, the tablet here for Meredith Avenue. How old are those tablets, Tim? 
I think they're from the early 1900s, the War Department tablets that mark the avenues. And of course, we do count those as monuments also. And we argue about what we should count as a monument, what we shouldn't count as a monument. And if you count everything, some people come up with 1,700 monuments, markers, and tablets. But again, it all depends on how you qualify what a monument is and what a monument isn't. Right, good. Somebody's asking uh, what Buford's cavalry did after the First Corps and Union infantry showed up on the field. Um, the cavalry, which uh, you know initially confronted the uh, southern advance, then rode to the flanks of the Union army and scouted the areas on both the right and left of the Union troops that fought in the first day's battlefield. That's great. And then we have a question. Is it true that General Hancock and his way to the battle passed a wagon carrying General Reynolds' body? Yeah, so General Reynolds is killed. Uh, killed instantly. You know, some people argue about whether he tried to talk a few minutes later or whether he just died instantly. But uh, his body was taken into the town and uh, late that afternoon, it was put in a wagon and was taken down the Tawny Town Road to Tawny Town, Maryland, where I believe it was taken over to Union Bridge, Maryland, put on a railroad, sent over to Westminster, you know, sent to Baltimore, then to Philadelphia and back to Lancaster where he was buried. But on the Tawny Town Road, on the late afternoon of July 1st, General Winfield Scott Hancock saw the body of General Reynolds being taken to Tawny Town, Maryland. And I like this scene too. You'll notice we're kind of driving uphill. And uh, as on the morning of July 1st, after Buford's cavalry had withdrawn and Archer's brigade, the Confederates are coming up the hill on this side of Willoughby's Run. You can see um, from here so clearly that they really couldn't see the top of the ridge um, in front of them and they could not see the Union infantry that had just arrived onto the field and was being directed into Herb's Woods by Reynolds at the time of his death. So it's a really interesting part of the battlefield. It is a good point that somebody made about the woods being much more uh, dense today than it must have been at the time. Yeah, all the accounts of the battle suggested the soldiers can see hundreds of yards through the woods and are firing at each other. But um, here we notice there's a, um, uh, if we uh, just pan around in front of us just for a second, there is a farm vehicle that is uh, uh, gathering uh, wheat from the field. And, uh, you know, the Park Service leases the land out to local farmers. And we have cows on the battlefield and crops where crops would have been. And you can see the seminary in the background, the Lutheran Theological Seminary. And that's a really good idea because, you know, can you imagine if you did not allow this area to be farmland, how difficult it would be to maintain the open spaces that were farmland at the time of the Civil War? And we have a question about how many witness trees are left on the first day's battlefield. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, I do not know how many witness trees are. I don't think there's ever been an actual um, physical study done by the Park Service on witness trees. I personally do not know of a witness tree on the first day's battlefield. There's a few in town, a few on the second day's battlefield. People are always telling me they're witness trees, but I don't have... They don't have sources for that information besides their own imagination. It's a good place, too, to point out the beautiful restoration job done by the American Battlefield Trust. You can see Lee's headquarters, the Mary yeah. Thompson House in the distance, the orchard associated with the Thompson House that's been replanted. Uh, there's also an orchard on, the, on this side of the Chambersburg Pike that the National Park Service maintains. Um, and there would have been a couple more structures on that corner uh, by uh, the Thompson House. The Alexander Riggs House was across the street. We did some archaeology there a couple years ago. You'll have to check out those videos and posts. Uh, and then part of the original James Thompson House, Mary's son, uh, is still standing in the distance. It's kind of hard to see, I'm sure, on your screen. But the central part of that building is a stone structure. So now, Tim, do we want to, maybe we'll pan back around and take a look. The sun's a little bit bright, so I'll get into the shade so we can get a better shot of it. But we're now at the scene of uh, Reynolds' death, uh, the Reynolds' death marker. Um, do, we, do you want to elaborate so more the, on this? So, you know, uh, the Reynolds Woods, as it was referred to by the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, was purchased early on in the history of the GBMA. It was the first piece of property on the first day's battlefield that was purchased and preserved. And I believe it was 1885 that the marker for John Fulton Reynolds was placed here. And it actually was placed by the Gettysburg GAR. And uh, it really was placed 
no one who placed the monument was here at Reynolds' death. And there's lots of different accounts of where Reynolds was when he was killed. And, uh, you know, there was an R cut into a tree, and then there was a sign placed on the tree, and the sign was moved around from tree to tree to tree. So basically, we know he was just killed at the edge of the woods. I tend to think that he was killed uh, a bit south from where that monument is, somewhere near the uh, corner of the woods, uh, and we just rode around and not at this location. But again, you know, with markers that mark the specific site of something, I always think there's a grain, you know, you gotta, you gotta give them a, um, uh, a little bit of latitude in marking them. And I don't think anyone uh, thinks that these markers exactly mark this or that, it, but it's just in this area that Reynolds was killed. Right, we've got another question. Oh, I should, let me mention that General Reynolds, you know, you can visit his grave. His body was taken to Lancaster. Today he's buried in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in Lancaster Cemetery at the corner of Lemon and Lime Street. That's great. Another question, why does Doubleday get a bad rap when he was, re and he was relieved of command at the end of Well, the I think Doubleday gets a bad rap because Edwin Connington did not like Abner Doubleday, and he wrote the preeminent book, Gettysburg is Studying Command, and he trashes Doubleday in his book. I actually like Abner Doubleday. I think the real reason, though, that Abner Doubleday is not as popular is because a lot of the Army officers did not like him. Um, he didn't have the uh, e most easygoing uh, um, uh, you know, uh, personality, and also he was an ardent abolitionist, and that kind of rubbed uh, some of the Army officers the wrong way. So Doubleday does get a bad rap. I think he did perform very well in the first day's battlefield. And uh, I prefer Doubleday to General Howard. And obviously, Coddington prefers General Howard to Abner Doubleday. And if you read the book, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. That's great. And then we have a, a John Burns question. Maybe we want to actually pan around the other way. Um, and I'll try not to get hit by a car while we do that. Um, there's a question, where did Burns lay overnight, supposedly? And maybe since we're right here, Tim, I believe we're near the site where John Burns received yeah. his last wound and was, was then, you know, so, uh, laying out on the, on the field. Uh, in my book on John Burns, I do have a photograph of the site where John Burns laid for the night after his final wound in the leg. And the photograph uh, is taken uh, down the slope uh, here, I think I would just say about 50 yards off uh, in the distance here. And in the photograph, uh, you can actually see the back of uh, the Gilbert Reynolds uh, first New York Light Artillery Monument in the background in that photograph. And that photograph was recorded by William Tipton, I believe in 1916, and the site was shown to him by Joseph Riggs, who was a personal friend of John Burns, and who John Burns showed the site where he laid uh, that night. And of course, it was the Riggs house, his mother's house, that John Burns crawled to, crawled to early on the morning of July 2nd. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, you know, then eventually you got back into town. One thing I always like to mention about Burns on the afternoon of July 1st, or I should say the evening of July 1st, he falls, is laying on that slope as uh, Scales Brigade passes over him towards Seminary Ridge there. And right up there near the Croft House, there were six Napoleons of the 5th main battery and they were firing double canister into Scales Brigade around right where John Burns was laying. You know, the ground must have just been like torn up around him with canister balls and it's amazing he wasn't killed as many of Scales Brigade were killed in that charge after he was wounded. That's great, Tim. And then so you have a question kind of an, about architecture and Pennsylvania barns. So are there different styles of barns on the battlefield? Maybe if we go back to the other side for a minute, unless it's going to be too bright, we'll, we'll get down a little bit. You can see now the McPherson barn uh, from the other side of the road here. And uh, this is kind of a standard Pennsylvania bank barn. The bank goes up in the back and, and it has a lower story underneath. Uh, but that is the original McPherson barn. And we talked about earlier the Slens family who lived there at the time. Thank you. 
lost the internet. That's great. <laughs> so it is a, a beautiful night to be out and, and doing this. It looks like there's a truck coming by, so we'll speak a little louder. Um, but we're looking off now in, on the camera. You can, you can see the, coming up on Route 30 or the Chambersburg Pike. Uh, and the fence line's actually kind of recently restored along the Chambersburg Pike, maybe four or five years ago. Um, they re replaced this Virginia worm fence um, that had been there at the time of the battle. Also post and rail fence on the other side. And we, we typically use the, the Warren map of the battlefield, which was created in 1868 and 1869 to give us an idea of what the fence lines consisted of, where there were stone walls, where there were trees and orchards. And of course it's 1868 and 69, so it's not an exact uh, depiction of what it looked like at the time of the battle, but it's it's pretty good. And, and we th those are the maps that the Park Service and, and other entities like the American Battlefield Trust use when they're restoring property. Yeah, and it's difficult to, you know, we know what exactly what the battlefield looked like unless you have photographs, and the first day is not well covered in photographs. Now, we're crossing over the unfinished railroad excavation or the Thaddeus Stevens Tapeworm Railroad, which was a railroad project initiated by Thaddeus Stevens and friends uh, the, uh, in the 1830s. By 1839, the project had failed. It ate up a lot of taxpayers' money. That's why they called it the Tapeworm Railroad, and it remained unfinished until the 1880s. So at the time of the battle, it was basically a trench in the first day's battlefield in which it was used as a defensive position. There was heavy fighting around it, and um, it ran right through the middle of the farm that, you know, was owned by um, Edward McPherson at the time of the battle. That's right. Yes, and we have a couple more questions. So did John Burns, uh, another question about John Burns, did he ditch his rifle um, to a <laughs> Uh, to avoid, I believe the story that you're the, probably is the person's referencing is that he had kind of buried his ammunition and ditched his rifle aside to, to to give people the idea that he was just out looking for his cows and had not actually been uh, actively participating in the battle. Now, there's something I wanted to point out. Uh, if you swing to the other side for a moment, there's a, oh, there's, a there's a fence right here, and this fence line right here is along the northern boundary of the Edward McPherson farm. And this fence line uh, continued from those woods out to the other side now of the car. I know it's really sunny out there, across, um, what is that, um, um, uh, sorghum or? Um, <laughs> Don't um, ask me. Okay, <laughs> so um, uh, out across there to the woods. And I tell you, you know, we talk about restoring areas to the way they look like at the time of the battle, restoring fences and such. And for whatever reason, and, uh, you know, I don't know, n we've never, when I say we, I mean like historians or the Park Service, has never um, been interested in restoring that fence all the way across to the woods. And that's where the 147th um, New York uh, fought desperately on the first day's battle. And it would be that fence line that Daniel, uh, Junius Daniel's brigade crossed in her attack against Stone's brigade. And I think it's one of the big missing fence lines on the battlefield that we talk about a lot on our um, uh, tours. And again, it's the boundary between the James J. Wills property and um, the McPherson property. And if we just swing back around to these woods now for a moment, this wood lot, would ex which extends from the unfinished railroad up along what we call Oak Ridge in the distance to where uh, the Forney Farm is located. Uh, this on some maps and some books is referred to as the Will McPherson Woods. And I think sometimes people believe there's some guy named William McPherson that owns it. But no, it's partly Edward McPherson's Woods and James J. Will's Woods. So somebody came up with the name Will McPherson Woods, which kind of can just confuses people. Um, I tend to refer to it as the railroad woods because that's what the local people called it because it extended from the unfinished railroad at the time and we have several references to that. It's actually a northern extension 
the woods of Seminary Ridge, and you know sometimes we call it Oak Ridge as we get a little bit farther up. But that woodlot was there at the time, and there was heavy fighting out in front of it and through those woods on the afternoon of the first day of the battle. Well, we do have a, a question about the ridges. So if we pan back to the other side, someone's asking about Hers Ridge. And yes, there are a series of, of rolling hills and ridges as you progress west out of Gettysburg. It starts actually pretty far out near Marsh Creek. There's also ridges far out like Belmont Ridge and, and other names that people have given to these, these things over time. Of course, this is just their names that locals came up with, and in some cases, names that we have from accounts of the battle. Um, but we should have probably clarified earlier, McPherson's Ridge is really two ridges. Um, there's one further west where the Burns statue is located and the McPher McPherson barn structure is today. And then there's another McPherson's Ridge that's closer to town where General Reynolds is killed. Um, and then beyond that is Hers Ridge, um, further west, across from Willoughby, uh, across Willoughby's Run. And uh, someone asked about what happened on Hers Ridge during the battle. Really, there wasn't a lot of fighting out there. There was some skirmishing in the morning between cavalry and, and, and Confederates as they moved into town. But uh, the Confederate artillery uh, positioned the, their batteries on Hers Ridge. And for, throughout the entire day on July 1st, they, they shelled Union positions on where, where our car is now, um, near uh, McPherson's Ridge from Hers Ridge, which is really not that far away. So that's a great question. Um, and uh, we'll see if we have any other questions. Um, we've got a question from our friend Veronica. Uh, she's asking, any reason why the Forney Farm site isn't marked with one of, with one of the black rectangular cool. markers? That's a cool. good question. And we will actually start moving We're going to pass by that. the Forney Farm, so we'll uh, talk about that in a moment. Um, as we drive along here, you can see that uh, soybeans, this is probably soybeans, we have crops, where crops would have been at the time, not necessarily the same crops. Let's stop here just for a question, uh, just for something I wanted to mention here. If you see this as a brigade plaque, and in the early 1900s, the War Department put brigade plaques around the battlefield to um, mark the basic location of each brigade in the battle. Northern brigade plaques have square, uh, granite bases and southern brigade plaques have rounded granite bases. This is Lysander Cutler's brigade. A brigade on average is about 1,500 men, about five regiments of 300 men each. Cutler's brigade was a little bit bigger um, uh, and you can see at the very bottom Cutler's brigade suffered uh, at the very bottom right a thousand casualties during the battle, just a huge loss of their men in the fighting. Uh, and some of you might know the first day's battle is bloodier than the third day's battle. The first day there was heavy fighting in these open fields, and I guess because there's no cover, a lot of heavy casualties in some of these units. Another interesting question, somebody's asking Tim um, if the veterans, you know, felt that the battlefield had changed dramatically and, well, you know, their thoughts on the, the, the preservation of the battlefield early on. Well, I'm sure they did so I think it had changed. And I don't think that, uh, you know, people at that time really thought much about preservation of the battlefield the way we do today. So they weren't upset when the giant Springs Hotel was built in the middle of the first day's battlefield. Uh, but one thing is I will mention, early on in this area, the GBMA, the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, only purchased a strip of land where we're driving, put a road on it, and put the monuments on the road. This does not mean that these units fought at these locations. This is where the land was that was purchased, and that's why the monuments are on these sites. This is not necessarily exactly where the line of battle was. The 76 New York could have been farther out to our right in, uh, or out in that open field. Um, that We know the 147th was not back where their monument is. We know they were out in this open field. By the way, this fence line was not here at the time of the battle. <laughs> so maybe we can take that fence and move it to the other place. There you go. Yeah. Now, um, so the park avenues were placed in by the War Department, you know, were GBMA roads, and then this is a War Department road um, that was placed in later. Okay, a little quicker. Now, uh, this actually lane goes up, and then if you go straight, you go into what I think the park refers to as the Wine Renner House. It's a, it's not a Civil War period house, 
but it's the site of the James J. Wills house. And as we go around the corner, here you can look down the driveway and you can see the Wills, uh, the site of the Wills house. And the park does own that property down there in that, that house. I, I believe that house is used uh, as a um, housing for the seasonal rangers. You can also see the extension of Hers Ridge. A lot of people don't visit, but Hers Ridge Road that continues uh, north of the Chambersburg Pike, and you can see that in the distance. And uh, like we mentioned earlier, you can see very prominently here the South Mountain Range, which was used by the Confederate Army to screen their movements north during the Gettysburg Campaign. It's a beautiful night on the battlefield. It is. Now, yes. a lot of the ground around here is preserved, and we're very fortunate to land all the way out to Her Ridge Road is preserved but you know um, there are areas around the battlefield that are still in danger of being uh, developed at some point um, and on our right this area we're entering now the area uh, and we'll pass over this fence here of the John Forney farm at the time of the Civil War and so uh, the 40s their house no longer stands and we'll answer Veronica's question in a moment up here but uh, uh, there was heavy fighting in these fields. And off to our right, of course, is where General Alfred Iverson's brigade was annihilated on the afternoon of the first day. And for many years uh, after the war, that area still contained southern bodies. Remember, it wasn't until like eight years after the battle that any attempt was made to recover the southern bodies from the battlefield and return them to southern cemeteries. So this area was filled with bodies. They probably didn't get them all when he attempted to recover the bodies of Alfred Iverson's brigade. And of course that became known as Iverson's Pits. And you already answered a question that <laughs> we have. Where is Iverson's Pits okay. on the Gettysburg Let's Battlefield? Go. Let's go up here. I'm gonna stop this going. While this, um, I'm gonna stop at this next round of these block and get in front of that. Absolutely. We love seeing people out in the battlefield enjoying the park. Oh, and before we do that, I want to answer one brief question. Someone's asking the distinction between the GBMA and the Gettysburg Foundation. Oh, we got some, some motorcycles. We just stop for a second. Um, and uh, the Gettysburg Foundation is a more recent organization that acts as the partner to the National Park Service. The Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association is a very early organization set up just after uh, the battle to, to start the preservation. Um, so really they have similar purposes to preserve and protect the, the battlefield, um, although the GBMA is a, a very early iteration of what is now you know, the Gettysburg Foundation, which is the partner of the National Park Service here in Gettysburg. Yeah, over the years there have been many entities who have been in charge of or were responsible for the care and maintenance of the Gettysburg National Military Park. And of course they would be like a early GBMA, which is run by local citizens, the later GBMA that was run by Union veterans, and then the Gettysburg National Military Park Commission that was run as part of the War Department that was run by a commission, and then of course the National Park Service. So in each one of those entities has run it a little bit different, but not that dissimilar. Uh, I was just going to point out, um, Alexander, back there that Wayside exhibit is to one of Buford's cavalry brigades, uh, Devon's brigade, and if you, anybody wants to come up with it, I was just going to point out that uh, the casualty rate on that is like 21 as opposed to 1,000. And of course, you know, it always irritates me when people think that the cavalry actually fought. They were scouts. They scouted the situation. They reported back to the high command. They don't really fight in the battle, and they don't suffer casualties. So that's a good example of two different brigades in the battle. Tim got that out of his system. <laughs> Someone's asking if the First Ace Battlefield is one of the best preserved views on the on the Gettysburg Battlefield. I would say it is. Well, it depends on how you qualify it, of course, because you know what I'm going to say. The First Ace Battlefield was fought in the town. Right. There's the Gettysburg College is in the middle of the First Ace Battlefield. The Lutheran Seminary is in the middle of the First Ace Battlefield. The town is in the middle of the First Ace Battlefield. Right. So actually the second and third day are much better preserved. But this area out here is just wonderful and it's really beautiful and uh, it's great to take visitors around this area. And look, they recreated the 
orchard at the Forney farm, which is really nice. And you see there's apples on the apple trees. One other question, are there any unrecovered bodies on the battlefield? Absolutely. And you know, I mean, it's only common sense. The soldiers are buried in mass graves or individual graves in the fields. It wasn't until 10 years later, eight to 10 years later, they attempted to recover the Southern bodies. Could they find them all eight to 10 years later? All you have to do is add up the number of men we believe were killed, you know, in action and buried on the battlefield with the number of bodies that we know were removed and the two figures don't really equal. Now, are there dozens of bodies on the battlefield? Or are there hundreds? I think that will be the point of debate. We don't know where they are. We don't look for them. There's no attempt to uh, try to recover bodies from the field. It's like a giant cemetery for the soldiers that fought here. We know they're out here, and we try to let them be uh, where, they, where they're located. Now, um, right now, we're in rear of what was the John Forney farm. And it's fascinating to me. Uh, our friend Veronica asked, uh, why didn't it ever have a War Department plaque saying Forney Farm? And it would have been really helpful if it did, because the farm was torn down in uh, 1937 to make room for the crowd that would be uh, here for the Eternal Light Peace Memorial dedication ceremony. And possibly, if it had a big plaque in front of it saying it was here during the battle, uh, maybe they would have thought more about whether they should tear it down or not. It is interesting that some farmhouses have War Department plaques in front of them telling you the name of the farm, and some do not. And I do not know the reason why some do and some do not. It, it seems to me it was kind of generic when they did it at the time. And now we're crossing the Mummersburg Road, which leads to the small town of Mummersburg. It's actually one of the oldest roads in our area. I think it dates to the 1760s. Um, and yeah, I think we're going to get out again here at the Peace Light in a, in a few seconds. Um, and we do have an incredible collection of photographs of the dedication of the Peace Light uh, at the 75th anniversary. Um, and we have photographs of President Franklin D. Roosevelt giving the, the remarks. Uh, we also know people here in Gettysburg who were in their, their 90s who were around and actually in the crowd that day um, alongside the veterans and, and the dignitaries and the president. Uh, Roosevelt was here, I think, twice, and this was the big visit for him. Um, but here you'll get a really great view looking off um, onto the, the first day's battlefield. You can see the Mummersburg Road, you can see across to McPherson's Ridge where we began the program, and you can see the monuments along Oak Ridge uh, where the Union Army's uh, the First Corps, the second division of the First Corps was deployed, um, and, and they were attacked, as Tim mentioned, by Iverson's Brigade and other, other brigades of uh, Robert Rhodes' division uh, that had arrived here on Oak Hill. Um, so we're gonna get out now, and I think we'll We'll, uh, we'll cover a few other things while we're here. I'm sure Tim could talk for a long time about the Peace Light. <laughs> so bear with us for a second. We also have a great view of the town of Gettysburg from, from here. You can see the steeples of Glatfelter Hall and the Gettysburg College campus. Now that wasn't standing at the time of the battle. It was built in the 1880s, but you can just a little bit see the, the cupola of uh, Pennsylvania Hall, Penn Hall, uh, which was built very early on uh, in the 1830s and uh, was a major hospital during the battle. Beyond that, there's steeples of the courthouse, of some of the churches, Christ Lutheran Church, I can see from here. Um, and then in the distance, you can see uh, the, the, the National Cemetery, the Soldiers National Cemetery, uh, the Soldiers National Monument. I think the New York Monument actually is what we can see from here. Um, and also, of course, to the left of that, East Cemetery Hill um, and Culp's Hill as well. So a great view from Oak Ridge. Uh, Tim, do you want to point out a few things while we're here? And I'll, I'll continue to, to watch and see if we well, have any let's questions. Let's walk up here a little bit. Let's walk up on the side. Okay, good question. Did the Union artillery that fled from the battlefield go through the town to get to Cemetery Hill or go around the town? 
I no, would they, say. they went through, through the, the town. town. Yep. And we have accounts of the, the chaos as, you know, we know that they had Soldier actually, him. they were separating out the Union 1st Corps and 11th Corps as the Union soldiers were retreating through the town, uh, keeping the 11th Corps on one side of the road and the 1st Corps on the other side of the road. And then the artillery was kind of passing through the middle. Um, so it was a pretty chaotic scene as uh, you know, thousands of Union soldiers are, are rushing through the town to a, a fallback position on East Cemetery Hill that they're really not sure how to get to. So, you know, obviously there was heavy fighting in the fields north and west of the town on July 1st. And I think one interesting thing about our battlefield and the way people tour the battlefield is they drive across the area of the first day's battlefield and they see the area where the first Army Corps fought in the morning action the first day, which was a northern victory. And then, because of just the way the tour is laid out, they might pass into the fields uh, north of the town where we learn about the 11th Army Corps and we highlight the defeat of the 11th Army Corps and how the Northern Army is driven back through the town. And people don't seem to ride back to talk about the defeat of the 1st Army Corps. So it's over the years, the story, and it's, you know, partly the, the fault of how our tour route is arranged. We talk about the 1st Army Corps and the Union victory and the 11th Army Corps and the Union defeat. And so you get a lot of negativity when we talk about the troops that fought north of town as opposed to the troops that fought west of the town because we never get back to the area and talk about the Union Army being driven through the town from the west. And I, I always think that's an interesting uh, point. Let me um, spin around here. Um, we won't look exactly at the sun, but let me just mention that one interesting thing about the battle and the battlefield that I think that people come here are very interested in is the fact that the mountain range is out to the west. The Southern Army started marching northward on June 3rd. That's the official start of the Gettysburg Campaign. And the Southern Army marched west across Virginia into the Shenandoah Valley. They came north through Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, and into Pennsylvania on the other side of the mountains. And then they scattered their forces across the Pennsylvania countryside, gathering supplies and provisions. Two days before the battle, Robert E. Lee learned that the Northern Army was advancing. And so Lee decided to order for the concentration of his army. He pulled out a map. He noticed 10 roads intersected the town of Gettysburg, and he ordered for his army to concentrate here. Now, it's a little more complicated than that. That's a simplified version of it. But if we just think about that, the Southern Army marched west, north, east, and then south. They covered some 200 miles to get to Gettysburg to fight in this battle. The first day the battle was fought in the fields north and west of the town. The first day, the South arrived with more men quicker. They outnumbered the Northern Army on July 1st. They overwhelmed the Northern Army, and they drove them through the town. Now, on the first day, even though the South won, only one half of the Southern Army was involved, roughly, and only one third of the Northern Army was involved, roughly. So the second and the third day would be much bigger and much big, bloodier. But the amount of casualties and the percentage of casualties amongst the troops engaged, it's one of the bloodiest days of the war. And I think percentage-wise, Chickamauga ranks a little higher, but the first day of the battle is certainly uh, uh, a serious, serious fight on its own, not referring to the uh, second or the third day. Now, I always like to try to explain, try to imagine some 20,000 Northern soldiers retreating through the town and back to Cemetery Hill beyond it, and some 30,000 Southerners chasing them, some 2,000 people hiding in their cellars, and all the roads lead to one spot in the center of the town. It was chaos. And I just don't think there's any appreciation of how horrible it must have been. Great. And yeah, we've got a couple questions. So this is a really great question. Did the airport on the Forney Farm cause significant changes to the terrain? Good. I'm very impressed by that person's yeah. question because there it is a kind of a little known fact that there was an airport in the middle of mm -hmm. this field or an airfield, maybe not a whole airport. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, I read about it um, and we talk about it a lot. 
and looking at the field, I could not tell you where the airfield actually was. But my impression from reading accounts of it is it's in uh, just to the right of the gully that runs through where you can see that the tractor uh, was uh, maybe somebody was drunk driving the tractor. <laughs> see, right through there is where my impression it was. And what's inter interesting is um, we've been working on our new museum for the Adams County Historical Society. We have a photograph of the Gettysburg Flying Service plane. We also have a brochure that explains how you could pay, a, and I forget how much it is, maybe a dollar twenty-five, and it would take you on a flight from here and you would fly around the Gettysburg battlefield and see the battlefield from the air. And it was it was just for a few years, all the time ahead from the late 20s to maybe the uh, 40s, um, just before World War II, you could uh, take this uh, flying toward the battlefield. And for a while, it was from the little airstrip that was right here. That's great. Oh, somebody says I wasn't drunk. I guess the guy uh, mowing is watching. <laughs> um, awesome. Good. A couple. So try to answer these quick if you can. But we've got a couple uh, questions about you know just uh, military strategy and and the the fighting around here. Somebody's saying if Reynolds was told to draw out the enemy and then withdraw to Emmitsburg, uh, why did he ask the Third and Eleventh Corps to come up? Well, um, I think if you study. Uh, this and this is a very complicated matter. I just noticed the brand new Gettysburg Magazine. Somebody did an article on Reynolds and his decisions. And if you read Connington, which uh, you know, since I just uh, criticized Connington for not liking Doubleday, his analysis of Reynolds and Meade is the best that is available. So the the sudden command and the decisions were made. Obviously, Reynolds dies, and we don't know what Reynolds is thinking. But it appears to me. And it appears to Connington that um, Reynolds is really worried about the gaps at Emmitsburg. And, you know, the Pipe Creek Circular indicates that if Reynolds meets a force at Gettysburg, they'll fall back to a pre-arranged pre pre defensive position. But the night before the battle, there were staff officers between Buford and Reynolds and Meade. And it seems to me that Meade gave Reynolds some latitude on July 1st where he was able to come up. And if he decided so, then the battle would be fought here and they would bring the rest of the troops up. So Reynolds has a little bit of latitude. It would have been great to have Reynolds' personal account of the events that occurred on July 1st, but we don't. And because we don't, a lot of people have speculated and written all kinds of stuff that probably, uh, you know, is not reliable. Good. A couple other, qu first a shout out, just Robert Clare is watching. Can you guess what, uh, who he's a descendant of, who's involved with Robert the Clare families on the first? Uh, Emma right. Yount. No, no, not quite. Oh, oh, oh it's Lydia Ziegler Clare. <laughs> yeah. But he, is he the, uh, the Younts? That's a different No, no, thing. it is, yeah. you're right. It is the, the caretakers of the, the okay. Schmucker Hall, the old dorm at the seminary. That's nice that Robert's joining us. And wonderful story of his ancestors that cared for wounded at the, the, the seminary building um, on Seminary Ridge. And uh, one other uh, military strategy related question How could Iverson's brigade not see the troops on Oak Ridge? So I guess how could they have well, not seen the disaster? Well, you know, it's very complicated, coming. but the plan is for Iverson's brigade to move in unison with two other brigades, uh, Edward Asbury O'Neill's brigade and, of course, Junius Daniel. And the three Confederate brigades, uh, you know, some uh, 4,500 men are supposed to start here, move across these fields and hit the flank of the Union First Corps and drive them off of the field. And if all three units would have moved in unison, they probably would have hit, uh, Iverson would have hit the center of the Union line and they probably would have driven them off the field. But the attacks did not occur in concert. O'Neill and Iverson did not act together. Junius Daniel, who sometimes people give him a break, I don't know why, decided to move off towards the Chambersburg Pike and not support Iverson. So Iverson ended up his brigade moved alone across the field 
and were outflanked by the arrival of Robinson's division on Oak Ridge and were annihilated in that open field. That's a somewhat simplified version of a very complicated thing. Good, good. And I think uh, one other, one last question here about the, the, the ridge uh, while we're on o Oak Hill. Uh, was Lee ever on Oak Hill to observe the fighting? Now, of course, he's over Absolutely on Hershey's Ridge. Absolutely not. Yep. And right. I know that there, it depends on what book you read, and I won't mention the book that suggests it, but they have Lee all doing all kinds of stuff he didn't do. Um, Robert E. Lee, pretty much on the first day's battlefield, uh, came up the Chambersburg Pike, was at Her Ridge, and eventually moved up and was at, occupied the headquarters along the Chambersburg Pike. And Oak Hill, um, he obviously sent messengers over here, and uh, Yule, Richard Yule, sent messengers back to Lee. One interesting thing is when Lee arrived, he sent a messenger to Yule to not attack and to halt the attack and wait until Lee got a grasp of the situation. But Yule had already had his troops in position. The 11th Corps came out of the town and was forming in the fields. And Yule, the aggressive one, actually is the one who ordered the assault that drove the Northern Army off the field and back through the town. And Lee was the one who wanted to stop the attack. Now, obviously, some people speculate that as after they captured the town, it was this cautious, uh, keep this cautiousness by Lee that led Yule to not attack Cemetery Hill. So, I mean, this is, these are very complicated things, and you could write a whole book about these matters, but I just thought I'd mention it. One more thing we should talk about while we're here. Let's walk, let's walk over here before we, um, we done all time? We're almost there. Okay. Uh, we do have the Eternal Light Peace Memorial, which dedi was dedicated in 1938 at the 75th anniversary of the battle. It was dedicated um, by the keynote speech was given by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was here for the occasion on July 3rd, 1938. And 2,000 or so veterans of the American Civil War that were uh, invited back to the ceremony. Uh, a very good friend of mine, a guy named Jim Klaus, I hope he gets to see this video. He did an incredible amount of research on the 1938 reunion at uh, National Archives 2. They have uh, the list of the people that they sent invitations to to attend the ceremony. Um, there were some 8,000 veterans of the American Civil War that were collecting pensions from the federal government at that time. Uh, in 1930, the federal government started giving Confederate veterans pensions. And um, all these people were invited to the ceremony. Uh, about 2,000, I think it's a little more, accepted and came. They each brought a nurse with them uh, and attended the ceremony. Um, you should know that, um, uh, like I was mentioning, Jim Klaus went through each of the people who came here, each of their files, and he figured out and he would... He would not like it if I don't remember the exact figure, but I think it was around 120, he said, were actually Gettysburg Battle veterans. So by and large, they were not. By and large, the people who attended were young men at the very end of the war. But of the 2,000 veterans, at the 75th anniversary, the average age was 94. And can you imagine them? The crowd that attended the ceremonies in Gettysburg during the 1938 reunion is estimated to be like 200,000 people. I have met lots of people that were kids that attended the ceremony. Uh, I've talked to in my lifetime, and the one thing they all talk about is how there's no highway. All the roads leading into the town for miles were backed up with cars of people that they had to just park in the road and walk to get here because you couldn't get into town. It's right. just amazing. And we do have photos of that as well, with uh, yeah. people walking and all the cars just stopped in the road. Pretty amazing. But the mine is dedicated to peace eternal and the nation united. And, uh, you know, I, I think for people who come here, it's one of the more amazing uh, monuments on the battlefield. One thing I always like to talk, t tell people is that uh, um, uh, what state do you think sent the most people to the ceremony? Probably something unexpected like California. California <laughs> sent more veterans to the ceremony than any other state, and there were no California troops here at the battle. And don't be saying the California regiment because they're from Philadelphia. <laughs>
thank you. That's great, okay. Tim. Well, thank you. We reached an hour, and we'll definitely do this again. It seems like we had over 200 people watching the whole most of the, the video, so it's really nice to, to be with you tonight, and I'm glad that, that this uh, new format worked. We'll try to do more of, of these driving-slash-walking tours if Tim uh, yeah. is up for it. <laughs> we tried to stay close to where our building is and do something with the battle, but we'd really like to do live videos, if we could, of historic sites around Adams County, and we'll just have to watch and see where we have, uh, you know, uh, reception where we don't. Right, yes, and, and thank you. Somebody did ask where the new Historical Society facility will be located, and, oh. and when we looked at the town, it's actually not far from here on the edge of Gettysburg, ne next to the, the nursing home out on the Biglerville Road uh, on the edge of Gettysburg, and we're building a, a structure there that'll uh, look very similar to some of the farms on the battlefield. It's uh, kind of designed to, to be in keeping with the surroundings, and we'll be able to put a museum there and, and get our artifacts into proper storage, and we have millions of historic items that are uh, in an old Victorian house right now and we're so excited to get those into safety and and be able to share them all with you so uh, i'm so glad you could join us tonight and i hope you'll like our page and check us out on youtube too we have tons of videos on youtube and we've we've been getting more and more subscribers and people are seem to really enjoy uh, watching these recorded videos after the programs have aired um, so we'll continue to do these as much as we can and uh, um, it, it's so nice to, to have a, a wonderful audience with us tonight and a beautiful day in the gettysburg battlefield have a good night everybody